Well, if you have your Bible, go with me to the book of Acts chapter 10 from verse 1 to verse 6 and just going to look at another angle of that memorial prayer, memorial giving and memorial prayer. And we'll continue to see, look at that and see that there were angels involved. There was an angel involved. There was an unbeliever involved who was a godly man. There was an apostle involved. There was the servants of an unbeliever involved. There was a soldier involved. And, uh, and, and God was involved. Holy Spirit also was leading Peter. So I want you to see something today about how God works corporately. He doesn't just work on his own without any human involvement or angelic involvement or circumstances. It's all working together. You need to know about this, that there is the oneness of God in creation. And so creation comes from God. We all come from God. We are one church, many members, and yet we must stay believing in oneness. So it is unity in diversity. And that's what God wants us to understand that every one of us has a part to play in all this. Now, it does not mean everybody has a part to play that we must accept substandard things being done in the church. And so God is working with all of us. We are imperfect. Make no mistake. If you're looking for a perfect church, then when you find that church, you'll make it imperfect. There are no perfect churches. We are all imperfect people with one perfect Savior. And so Jesus is the only perfect one, and we are all imperfect. But it does not mean our imperfections must not be addressed. It does not mean that we mustn't get skilled. We all are a work of God in progress And every one of us, even though we're imperfect, we are making allowances for one another and understand we are imperfect, but there are some things that are not acceptable in a corporate gathering. Amen. Hallelujah. So God is working like that, and that's why we need to understand that we are all accountable but we're still family in the name of Jesus and we're still smiling and laughing and we're having a good time. Come, give the Lord Jesus a big hand. That's what it's all about. Amen. So here in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it? Lord, and he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Praise God for his word. So we see here, church, that it is evident that this this. Roman um, centurion, uh, he was not saved, but somehow he admired Christianity, and he admired Judaism as well, and he was praying. I'm convinced in my heart that he was praying that all Gentiles should get saved, that the door should be opened up for all nations to come into the kingdom of God. I'm convinced that he was praying that all cultures should be, access should be given to them into the kingdom of God because God was so moved. Not only was he praying, but his giving coupled with his praying. That's, that's, that's a, a, one of the greatest ways to move God is when you have a, a great need and you pray for it, and you sow for it. When praying and sowing goes together, 
it builds something in the realm of the spirit which the Bible calls a memorial. And so it calls an angel to be dispatched uh, from God to tell Cornelius his prayer is heard. In other words, if God heard the prayer, it's answered now. And his giving is had as a memorial in the presence of God. That means his giving and his prayers became something eternal. And this is the day of Pentecost. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost when there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where all were sitting and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And these 120 began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Now everybody knew that these were Galileans in the upper room, but they were speaking in languages of all the nations that were gathered around Jerusalem. And they could not understand that. So we understand that the coming of the Holy Ghost that the falling of the Holy Spirit upon people, that the anointing is here to break down barriers and bring races together, uh, break down barriers, bring cultures together, break down all dividing walls that divide the rich from the poor and uh, the, the divide the educated from the ed uneducated, divide those that are of a high social level from those that are low social level and and, uh, and everybody becomes one because we all by one spirit baptized into one body, the body of Christ. Hallelujah. So that is doing church and life together. That the high and the mighty are one with the low and the oppressed. Hallelujah. We're all one in God. So in, in, in Ephesians 1.10, in the dispensation of the fullness of time, the Bible says God is bringing together, gathering is that term, that word gathering is harvesting it. He's gathering it together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and even in earth. So this oneness is is so important to God because we see this in the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three people, three separate persons. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. They're three separate persons, but it's one God ex expressed in, in diversity, but one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then we are born of this God, in fir first of all, God's creation comes out of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see that the Father is cre a creator in the Word of God. We see that the Son is a creator. And we also see scriptures that the Holy Spirit is also a creator. So God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, all brought creation into being, working together. Then, after the fall, God sends his Son, and his Son goes to the cross, and one one sacrifice once for all is a sacrifice that brings all the nations and the cultures together to be one family of God and we are uh, an extension if you will of the Godhead above all that is created and so God's dream God's heart is for a unified expression of God through humanity and creation, bringing them into oneness. And yet, it's God working through, with himself, working through man, working through the angelic host, working through creation, and yet it looks like there's a whole lot of activity, but the harmonizing is so beautiful that it brings forth one result in the name of Jesus. And it's unmistakable that it is God. So we, we are called by God to be like a symphony, to, 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 to just flow with God, to have a heart like that. And you don't have to be the main guy. 
You don't have to be the one that's being praised. You don't have to be the one that's receiving the money. You just have to be the one that's hearing the heart of God. That is worth more than any money. If you just can allow God to work in your life to bring to pass his purposes. And so here in this, it opened the door and that door is still open for an effect. It's an effectual door that whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to get saved. And I got saved because of Cornelius. I got saved because of Peter. I got saved because of that angel. I got saved because of that soldier. I got saved because of two servants in Cornelius' home that were prepared to, to operate and just flow in the symphony. And my friend, when we understand that that is how the whole of creation is working together with God, it brings us to the place where you want to be sensitive. You want to not grieve the Holy Spirit. You want to love righteousness and hate sin, hate iniquity, because sin hurts people, destroys people. And God is not a God of sin. God loves people, he loves a sinner, but God actually hates sin. And you ought to have that in your heart, that I hate that which God hates, and I love that which God loves. We don't hate the sinner, man. We hate the sin that the devil is using to destroy people's lives. So the point I'm bringing you to is to have a joint participation in God to be able to flow together. And the more you flow like that together, the more you'll find your needs are always met. That is what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You will find your success is in flowing like that in the kingdom of God. You will find that your protection from God for your family is working like that in God. It's not about just me getting so wealthy but me just getting so successful. So this is all joint participation. If Jesus, if you could rewind the clock 2,000 years ago and you wanted to find where Jesus is, where would you find him? You'll never find him in the palaces. You won't find him sipping coffee in Beverly Hills, but you won't find Jesus there. You'll find Jesus amongst the poor people. You'll find Jesus amongst the hurting people. You'll find Jesus among the sick people. You'll find Jesus amongst the children, blessing the children. And so thank God for the message of prosperity. Well, that's what I'm trying to say to you in everything I'm saying. Thank God for the message of success. Thank God for the vision of this church is to lift you up. But God forbid that you are going on the ladder alone and that you're just going to be successful all by yourself. All the money you get, you must be able to give it back to the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 12, verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God. Now there's nothing wrong if somebody helps you and there's a small clause written there to bless them. I think that's so great. Why? You don't want to forget the person that took you up. You can't just, you can't go and buy bread for nothing. And so if somebody blesses you, you'll be a blessing to them too. Rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now look what he says. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have, give alms, provide yourself bags, which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So you take note, the kingdom belongs to Jesus. Thine is a kingdom. Thine is a power. Thine is a glory. But it, what is a kingdom? His rule. His way of working. This is how God works. The kingdom. And so, but... It gives him good pleasure to give us the way he works. 
So God is not selfish at all. It gives him such good pleasure to give something so valuable like the kingdom of God to his little flock. Now we are all called to be uh, participators in this. And so this unconventional way of praying, what we shared with you this morning is where it sounds like we're instructing God. It's not that we're instructing God, it's God's will being revealed to us and we speak the will of God into being and we decree a thing and it shall be so. But you must know the will of God for your life and for you to decree it instead of just decreeing things that God doesn't even know about. Then you are playing around on a dangerous road when you start decreeing things that God does not know. So Psalm 45 verse 11, thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons. So that is what God is saying to you. Ask God of what he wants to do concerning his children. You ask God that. Make that a prayer of yours. God, what do you want to do in our church? What do you want to do in the sons of God's lives? Ask me. Ask me. Ask me. God is imploring you. But you, you, you're asking for so many different things, but you're not asking him for his will in other people's lives. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and, and then concerning the works of my hands, then you command me. Wow, can you see the connection there? Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and once you know what he wants to do in his family, then start commanding the works of his hands. He doesn't say, command the works of his hands without asking what he wants to do. Once you know what he wants to do, you can speak to him because you are working with him. You are an extension of God in the earth. The kingdom is now yours. It's his, it's yours by stewardship. And so you are now a God man. You're a God woman. And you are now decreeing things as though you are instructing God. And then it comes to pass. It's a very unconventional way of praying. There's no begging there. There's no trying to twist God's hands there. And we go to the scripture to you. Uh, Psalm 8 verse 6, thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands and thou hast put all things under his feet. Wow, God has made you to have dominion over the works of his hand. God has made you to have dominion over the works of his hands. You are made, you are tailor made for this dominion. He has made you. You're not trying to be who he doesn't want you to be. You are not trying to be some high and mighty person putting all things under your feet. No, he has made you to have dominion and he has put all things. Oh, he has put it. Say it's a put job. Yes, all things under my feet. What things? Things I got to rule over. So I can, command, I can move the hand of God. That's what it means. You see, when it gets to the face, I got to... I got to do that by love. I got to do that by worship. And it's wonderful when his face is shining. But when it gets to provision, hey, you got to be a mover and a shaker now. You can't be waiting for God to do it all without your participation. You can't be waiting for God to do it without your excellence. 
if you refuse to be excellent and stubborn, that's how much longer you will stay stuck without progress in your life. And I've shared this with you. Don't ever think the world system will open up a door for you if you are substandard in your business, in your career, you'll get no promotion that way. You'll get headhunted if you become excellent and a person of integrity. Absolutely powerful. So we're working all these things together. And so 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 tells us here, who, verse 16, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. But then we have the mind of Christ. I guarantee you, you won't find any concordance joining that scripture with the other scriptures that I've quoted to you. Because you'll only get that by revelation. And it's present day truth. Where the Bible, if you follow the scriptures and you'll read the context, it tells us your eyes has not seen, your ears has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart the things that God has prepared for those that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. You get these things by revelation. What things? Things you have not seen. Things you've not heard. Things that have never entered into your heart. God reveals those things by his spirit. But it's things that he's already prepared for you. And if you read on, it's speaking in the same context. Write down and it says, and who has known the mind of the Lord. So we understand that God got a way of thinking. That's the mind of the Lord. What is God's way of thinking? God's way of thinking is that he's revealing things for you that will show you how much he loves you. Things that he's prepared for you that your eyes has never seen. It's the thoughts of God is in the words of God. And you get your destiny in the word of God. And now when you know that that is how God is thinking, it says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So it's meaning that when you know the mind of the Lord and you cooperate with God, it will be like you telling God what to do for you. But really, we like that, you see. It's helping us understand. We say we chose God, but God chose us first. You know, God chose us. That's why we chose him. We, we love him because he first loved us. We, it sounds like I'm instructing him to do this thing for me. Jehovah, do it for me. But Jehovah told me he's done it already. That's exactly how this thing works. So you tell God what he's told you by revelation, which is now yours. It's not information. So you're not trying to copy somebody else. You've got your own tailor-made slice in Jesus' name. Now go with me to Mark chapter 16 and look at some things here, how this thing works. So we're teaching you how to operate in the realm of the spirit with God, with man, with the church, with creation. It's all working together for good. God doesn't have control of whether you will obey him or disobey him. He doesn't have control of whether the next person will obey him or disobey him. He doesn't have that control, but he has control of his purposes being fulfilled, and he will work with everything, even your disobedience and your weakness and your failings. He'll work it all together to bring through his purposes in your life. And so it's all, he's got control over end product results. God's got that control. But the journey from here to here, he's working with all imperfect people. But the quicker we learn how he works and we cooperate with him, the quicker we can enjoy this journey. 
and don't fall into crisis upon crisis and get bruised and bumped about and you can just enjoy the journey and the end product results mark 16 verse 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now that's what God said to them. That's what Jesus said to them. Now let's look at what they did with what God said to them. They got this revelation. Now this is what it says. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now this is, we very seldom speak of verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord say the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following he gives the word we preach that word he works with that word and confirms the word but you're going to have to get it first from God you're going to have to get it as a revelation and you're going to have to do it and Tie yourself to excellence. Tie yourself to commitment. Tie yourself to righteousness. And then you will be able to look at your life and understand God done this business. God kept my family. God kept my children. God built the church. Was I not involved? Yeah, I was involved. But I understand it doesn't matter how high and mighty I can become, even if I'm right on the top, I understand that every step or rung of that ladder, it was by the grace of God. And I will not forget that I was down in the gutter and he lifted me up from the guttermost to the uttermost. And this whole journey is a journey of praising him and worshiping him and giving back to him and to people everything he desires to do through my life. That is the kingdom of God. Isaiah 43 verse 25 to verse 26. God says this, I, even I, and he that blotted out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and I, and will not remember thy sins. Now what a scripture is that? That is a scripture for you to put in every room of your house. Put it on the fridge, on the stove, in the bedroom where your wife scolds at you, and in the bathroom where you leave your clothing lying around. Put it everywhere. Let's, let's read it together. One, two, three. I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Now, who said that? Now look what he says, the next verse. Put me in remembrance. Let us now plead together, declare thou that thou mayst be justified. So God is telling you what he has done for you with your sins, just like he'll tell you everything you want to know regarding the future of his sons and you, and that you may know his mind, that you can cooperate with him and work with him. And he's saying, now you must put me in remembrance. God, do you forget that I got to remind you? You see that what memorials about. Memorials, you build memorials in the realm of the spirit 
God comes down to our level to communicate to us in such a way that we can understand that there are things that you do with your life that in the realm of the spirit, they just remind us, they triggering God's memory all the time. And he says, put me in remembrance. Then he, he doesn't even say, you must plead. He says, let us plead out together. In other words, come on his side. What he says, just line up with him. So he says, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Then he says, declare thou. Why? That thou mayest be justified. If you don't declare what God has declared about you, you won't be justified. You won't be able to receive what he has already prepared for you. That brings us to the place where when it gets to your forgiveness, when it gets to everything you need in life, it's not going to rain down manna from heaven anymore. If you're wanting that type of miracle, then you want to go back into the wilderness. And we've come too far to go back into the wilderness. And so whatever God has done for you, for you to receive it, you've got to cooperate with God. If you don't cooperate with God in oneness, in a symphony, in a harmony, you can find yourself losing out on an ability to receive from God what is already done or what is already given to you. I want to encourage you today. Refuse to be a backseated person in life. Refuse to see yourself as a second grade person. You push yourself to the front all the time. And it doesn't mean that you must be careless. You are going to be instructed in the word of righteousness. You are going to be trained. You're going to be taught. Understand that it's not about picking up offenses. We are not here because we got something personal against anybody. Or else God remove me from this pulpit. I got nothing against any human being. It's not about being personal. But it's about skilling you in the word of righteousness. It's about you and me wanting you to understand the realm of the spirit. How you can cooperate with God. And, and get your provision, get your destiny, get what God has already done for you in the name of Jesus. God wants to promote you from a life of prayers that are not answered. And from today, I decree and declare over your life that your prayers are answered. God has answered your prayers. Your prayers are heard and your giving is had as a memorial in the presence of God and today God has dispatched angels to open doors for you that no man can shut angels to close some doors that there'll never be a remembrance ever again of the wickedness of sin you've committed from today your life is changed today is the first day of the rest of your life step out of that boat and walk on the water step out of limitations and begin to stretch forth to the east and west north and south be that in jesus name amen and amen and amen